This video is only possible thanks to viewers like you. To support the channel and get more, go to patreon.com slash optimistic duelist and subscribe. Link in the description. Hey gamers, Optimistic Duelist here, and today we're going to talk about Olive Bloods. Like Bronze Bloods, Olives are cast under the shadow of the Rogue, and so tend to be disregarded by the Empire and left to more or less fend for themselves. Many Olives seem to live closer to nature than other casts, in forests or caves, and as outlaws they often turn to lives of crime, working as thieves or hitmen. Unlike Bronze Bloods, however, they're not inclined to want to prove themselves on Alternia's terms. Their response to societal neglect generally has them turning to a kind of self-reliant survivalism. Olives generally know themselves and what they're capable of, and tend to distrust the social systems that would have them believe themselves lesser than others. This self-awareness may partly be the result of their karmic connection to the mage class by way of the Disciple. As a manifestation of the active prophet archetype, the Disciple was the sufferer's lover and closest confidant, having been said to have entered a relationship with him that transcends the quadrants. She transcribed his teachings from memory, single-handedly and miraculously ensuring that they would survive into Alternia's present. This link may also be why Olives have a particular passion for romance and have a bit of a reputation as romantic counselors and guides. Both mastery and understanding of the self and romantic bonds intense enough to be described in terms of soulmates are ideas strongly associated with the heart aspect which deals with the strong idealism and identity that drive the inner light of the soul and the dark, primal instincts of the body that the soul expresses itself in reality through. Moving on to our Olive Bloods, we'll start with Boldir Lamati, who I'm pretty sure was described by her writer, Aisha Farah, as a seer. Aisha's really really cool and has a Patreon, by the way, go check it out, it's in the description, thanks. Which is really fitting, because Voldir understands who she is and her relation to the world around her more than any other troll on Alternia. Though that might have a little bit to do with the fact that she's a natural heartbound, and thus doesn't have any kind of conflict with her caste given aspect. She wields the role and identity of an outlaw deftly, seamlessly weaving it into her persona when it's necessary, and putting it neatly away when it's not. She has the clarity to know when it isn't, because Bulldeer understands not just the political mechanisms of Alternia, but seemingly a great deal of its metaphysical systems as well. She lives by a garden with a spiral shape at the center, and seems to regard the spiral as a symbol for the unfolding of reality itself. She's aware that Alternia exists because of identifiable, conscious forces that put it in place and charted its future. And she's aware that death is not exactly the end, and that Alternia is being puppeteered by Doc Scratch. What's more, she clues the reader into all of this, giving them the context to play their role in the rest of Frensim, effectively acting as a seer, providing context and cryptic guidance as she sends the hero on their fated quest. Next, we've got Sharon Krojib, who I identify as a Maid of Rage. Sharon is a capital A artist, through and through. They're fully committed to the labor of making art, not for anyone else or even their own pleasure, but simply because the art itself needs to exist. Perhaps because of Rage's affinity for performance, Sharon proves effective at leveraging the Rage's penchant for theft exploiting Estalla and Connell's pitch vacillation to gank their tracker for one of their art projects. Blackrom is said to be a domain of expertise for Curlaws in particular, and it's a tool Gamzee exploits to great effect against Terezi. So I don't think it's much of a stretch to connect it directly to Rage, especially since it comes hand in hand with angry and negative emotions. But the theft is only a means to an end, and the rogue role is a mask Sharon plays in service to their endless self-imposed labor. When the reader and Sharon succeed in making some real good art, the reader experiences something they describe as pure, zen-like, what the f which is not only very fitting for Rage's attitude of skepticism and confusion at the chaos of reality, but honestly is also a pretty solid way to regard life in general. 
Also, they own? And so Rava Sharon is my Hive Swap OTP, so at me with the fan art and fanfic. Thanks in advance. Next up, we've got Connell Okima, who's so comfortable playing the part of a rogue, I'm tempted to say she just straight up is one. She feels more comfortable when Azdaya is taking point on the planning, and she steals a phone off a corpse for the reader, empowering them for the rest of the adventure, literally stealing light for their benefit. But she is also extremely effective at destruction and killing, so much so that I almost think she could be a bard. And I think in the end, bard is what I'm gonna go with. If nothing else, because I'm sure she could put the cod piece to good use. I'm saying Asdaya gets <laughs> Last but not least, we've got Polipa Gozi, who is a breathbound, one whose personality is deeply tied up with their goals, direction, and sense of personal motivation. That ephemeral, situational flexibility might be why I struggle to get a specific read on her. Because there seem to be two sides to Polipa, and both seem real enough in the moment that I'm not entirely sure how she herself feels about either. On the one hand, we have the hardened hit woman who works alone. Polipa doesn't care what the target or challenge is as long as the pay's right. She's in it for the money, and that's that. To me, that screams thief. She only warms up to the reader as a friend once they prove themselves a competent accomplice worth sticking with. And yet, this nihilism is born of trauma. And she does have a softer side interested in romance. Before the attack that changed her life, Polipa ran a relationship advice blog. And she still sticks by Tagiri, the teal blood who helped her and saved her life, which kinda makes Tagiri her only remaining tether to society and morality pet. But if Polipa is covering up her gentler nature out of necessity, then who is she really, and what does she want in her heart? It's hard to say anything except that I hope we find out. I hope you enjoyed this round and that you'll stick around for the rest of the Hemo Spectrum videos. Thank you all so much for watching, and if you want to get sneak peeks to my scripts for these videos, feel free to check out my Patreon, where I post those early for anyone who's interested when I'm able to. Hope to see you next time, and until then, keep rising!